here we go. Welcome to the Coffee Talk today. It's uh, whatever March third, and uh, it's our new time. We're going to do Coffee Talk at 10 a.m. Uh, on the new schedule. You can have a look at the schedules. The schedule is always changing, um, and I'll I'll post it on the Twitch stream when it's not there. Uh, was I supposed to? Uh, yeah, I skipped that. So Coffee Talk starts at 10. Schedule is a little confusing. Uh, I am going to do a yoga reading at 9:30. And um, then do Coffee Talk right away at 10. So if anybody wants to just hang with me while we talk a little bit of metaphysical stuff before we get into the to the tech news of the day, then we can do that. That's that's the thing. So I've allocated 90 minutes, but we probably won't need all of that for every Coffee Talk. The Monday on Monday will definitely be that long, though, because it covers all the t- stuff from over the weekend that might happen. So once again, uh, Coffee Talk is just me going through my Twitter and the emails, alerts that have come in. And discussing things that you guys bring up on chat. That's what we do. So uh, I'm going to go back. I was finishing up a little bit of email here, cleaning it up. Uh, but rather than continue to do that, I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. So everything of value is on the Twitter account. So if you go to uh, Twitter slash rwxrob dot com, uh, you'll get the latest. And this is this is this is I do this because rather than use like a bookmarking service or something. It's just easier for me to do it this way, and you can go in here and click. The schedule is here too, by the way. All right, so uh, fresh schedule is, is news. That's a new thing as of yesterday. Uh, my wife's like, when did the schedule change? <laughs> so a little bit of personal news, but tomorrow I'm moving the studio upstairs where it's away from the kitchen <laughs> and all the other noises, and we'll, we'll give that a shot. I may or may not be able to maintain my full schedule tomorrow. Uh, based on that, because I'm moving quite a bit of equipment and got to get got to get some stuff set up up there. So uh, just know that's coming. And uh, what else we got? Uh, do, 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 do. So uh, just this morning, as this email came in, Proton Mail VPN uh, is now open source. Uh, I don't know. Some people are asking what it's based on. It is not, as far as I know, it's, I don't think it's using WireGuard. I don't know. I know it has OpenVPN built into it. Uh, so that might be something to look at if you're interested in that. Uh, it's definitely a great service. Uh, it comes with, I'm gonna. I'm just going to plug ProtonMail a little bit. I have nothing to do with them. I am a visionary member, which means that I'm paying probably more than I need to because I support them. I really want them to succeed, and they are. They are definitely succeeding. So if you wanted to join, you know, uh, if you want to join the, the group of people who are taking back their their privacy and their safety and um, basically the internet, <laughs> uh, and you want to get off Google, ProtonMail is the number one mail provider for that. Uh, there's another couple ones out there, Tutanoa, which is another sort of hackery uh, private one. So, uh, so secure-based email in Switzerland is actually, I read someplace that it's actually under like several feet of granite it's like their server room uh they have swiss laws in place um it's just really 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 good it's not and by the way their vpn isn't nord nord got hacked nord is a disaster don't use it um so if you or don't use any don't use any vpn for which you don't know uh who's going to have the keys and who's going to you know what country they're in so if you really care about vpn stuff if you if you want a highly 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 secure vpn that's even more secure than proton mail you probably want molvod molvod is the only vpn i know of that will accept cash payments without any account information including your name so so they give you an id and they give you uh, a vpn and that's it you know they they don't have any log tracking and they have no ability to associate any behavior with any specific person. And if you send them cash through the mail, which I think is illegal in some countries, so be careful, um, they will, um, they'll send you back a number and they'll, they'll fire you up. So I don't think there's a, a safer VPN solution out there right now for those who are like level, you know, interested in security that is at like, spy level you know i call it snowden level right if you don't want to be caught the way snowden was caught i mean he wasn't caught but the way that they got his data uh, then you need to start considering these kind of things they do not use open vpn at molvod no so molvod actually um 
ProtonMail does use OpenVPN, but they have their own thing on top of it. They use OpenVPN, but they have their own thing. I think WireVPN doesn't take this that much info and is based in Estonia. Hmm, that's a good one to know about. So WireVPN, let me go look that up. WireVPN. Um, I haven't heard of them. Thank you for that. That's why we do the stream. Dear user. <laughs> this is unfortunate. Oh, this, this would happen on the stream too. This is so sad. Listen to that. Unfortunately, we have bad news. As WireVPN, we have chosen to close down. We tried hard to stay afloat amid competitive market, but unfortunately, we're not able to continue. We have canceled any active subscription and closed our servers. <laughs> Take the money and run. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, if there's one thing that's going to scare people away from VPN providers, you know, it's like, we're going to get to it in another thing in Coffee Talk, but it's like, I read a thing that said how hacked everything was. Most VPN software is hacked. Yeah, well, it totally is. And I think Proton VPN is like just showing how, how good they are. I, I hope Vault Molvod stays around. The biggest annoyance with Molvod is that this beautiful little thing that you have to install is a full Electron app. So it's basically like running Chrome just to have your VPN connection. <laughs> and as far as I know, you can't turn it off. It's the most annoying thing. So, so yeah, the thing about this is you got to make sure you remember your ID because if you don't, I think it'd be a big old long number and that's your ID. Yeah, so uh, VPNs are going to become more of a thing. It's still safer than uh, browsing any other way. And if you're, if you truly want spy level security, you've got to, you know, I'm, I don't do this all the time. I'm not as, you know, good to talk about it, but uh, you definitely want to combine it with Tor. So if you do Tor, you should have a VPN and maybe even run Tails, which is an operating system that's completely independent. Uh, and it's it's only running over Tor, so there's no leaking. A lot of times people will use Tor and then it'll leak IP or DNS and then... But see, I like that the new DNS leaking stuff in Chrome may be combined with a VPN to, to make you really secure, so so you, you might not always have to use a, v, uh, a VPN with Tor, if that makes sense. Anyway, I mean him. Um, Sorry for that. Might have done a little Google before suggesting it's okay. No, I, it's great. I mean, I, I kind of like that we found that out. Uh, so those are two providers. Uh, the, the reason I was mentioning ProtonMail and I, 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 I think it's good is because it kind of comes with your it comes with your thing. So if you get if you sign up uh, with them and you get their uh, and the guys are I mean look at their profiles. They're like senior engineers, PhDs in particle physics. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about an engineering team. Their engineering team is like ridiculously good. Hey, Chip. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, I mean, you're just, I mean, even they're like customer support people, you know, it's like a degree in informatics and she's the customer support person. <laughs> I mean, aren't they awesome? It's like, I want to work for RotoML, you know? It's because they've been, they sorry, they've been they've been grabbing people from from CERN, right? Some of the best minds in our world, and so they just and they're they're like from all over, right? Kokoska, you know, Gambarella. <laughs> it's like if you watch the um, if you watch the Particle Fever documentary, there's like the accents and the languages, and so all these engineers speak like two or three or four languages as well. It's just so cool. I would. This would be my Disneyland. I would just want to go hang out and just watch all these like ridiculously intelligent people. <laughs> uh, you know, here we go. So anyway, yeah. But when you pay your five bucks a month for them, uh, it includes a it includes a VPN. So you get a VPN by default. So you get secure email, and now you get calendaring. By the way, so they just announced that. I don't have a link to it, but they have they just put uh, a calendar in their public beta. So yeah, they're 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 directly taking a shot at Google, and I love it because it is 100% private, it's 100%, and it's all encrypted. If you have somebody else who has a ProtonMail account, all your communications between the two of you are content encrypted. They're not they're not encrypted at the at the transfer port, you know, like making a socket and then talking through it. It's like the content is encrypted, which is the best of all. So and you can actually load your GPG keys if you want. 
Um, I haven't, but you can. And uh, uh, I mean, if you really, really want, you can sign up for Proton Mail anonymously, um, and you know, pay them in any number of ways. I don't. They my all that all my account information is on there. But that, and for that reason, unfortunately, um, like to know a lot of a lot of hackers use that, and that means that it will sometimes be flagged as, like for example, when you're using Netlify. If you're if you have an email that's a ProtonMail account and you created a new site and it's only got a few words on it, we've had a bunch of young people have their accounts blocked on Netlify, and there's no real notification as to why. So you have to call them up on customer service and they fix it in like ten or ten or twenty minutes. It's really amazing how fast Netlify's turnaround time. I am so impressed with Netlify. You know, it's funny because when they first came out, I was kind of like, uh, I don't like their logo as much as this other logo, and it, dumb reasons for not liking. But they're, everything about that company, it just is amazing. The people that they've hired, I've been watching who they've hired through Twitter. Uh, so what, I'm talking about another company here, so let me just shift for a bit, for a bit, Netlify. We talk about Netlify a lot on stream because it's really all you need for, to publish a site. Uh, there's only one downside of Netlify so far that I have found. And uh, the, the downside of Netlify is that uh, it does not support large files as far as I can tell. So uh, we had somebody with a, with a was it four, four or five gigabyte, no, megabyte, four or five megabyte video file that she wanted to use as a background for her web page. And we could not get it to work and we're still working on that. So if that proves to be true and you can't store like, movie clips as background images through we're thinking it might be because I haven't activated large file support in in GitLab but we are trying on GitHub and GitLab and Netlify and so far we haven't got that to work so if anybody knows uh, what might be up there that might be helpful because that that would be one thing that would be a that would be one small negative uh, I guess it but it's not that big of a deal considering you can do everything else on Netlify. You can do form processing, you can do Amazon for, uh, Lambdas for free, uh, you can do OAuth, uh, paywall authentication if you want to do that. Uh, you can do redirects, which are really awesome. And so it's just, it's a really, really great service. So we, we start, when I first start talking about ProtonMail, it usually kind of dovetails into a conversation about all the other really awesome services that you can learn out there. Um, and we have some visitors here. So, hey, what's your opinion on other big operating systems out there, on the big ones? Win, Mac, why did you choose Linux? Cyberpawn, that is a great question. Uh, we're doing a, this is a little segment called Coffee Talk. So uh, I'm going to redirect you to, to some information that I have already out there online. Um, if you, you know, look at the panel underneath, uh, we can talk about that. But um the short answer as to why to do Linux is because Linux is the most powerful, most important operating system on the planet. And, and it has been for a very long time. 90 plus percent, I would guess, of, of the internet is running on Linux. All the internet of things is running on Linux. Now that might change. In fact, uh, Viable from our stream it was, was suggesting yesterday that, that there's a chance, there's a possibility that within five to 15 years, we won't even have Linux on Internet of Things devices because it's not suited well for really, really tiny devices. It's the best operating system for tiny devices in existence right now, but there's there is some evolution in that space and there's new new operating systems like Fuchsia from Google and other things that are popping up to, to kind of meet that niche of like the ultra tiniest uh, operating system. So it's possible, it's possible that we'll see some some replacement for Linux someday. Uh, but not not for a long time. Uh, Windows itself now ships with Linux built in Cyberpon, so that's an answer for you. Um, so all new versions of a Mac, I mean, sorry, Mac by the way comes with uh, uh, free RTOS is everywhere too. Yeah, that's I haven't heard of that one yet, but I'll have to go look at that. So let me go search for that one since we're since we're talking about it. So yeah, it's very possible Linux will fade at some point. I mean, you know. Other operating systems have, uh, but it, it's going to be around for a long time. Free is a free real-time operating system. Kernel embedded devices has been ported to 35 microcontrollers. So this is like Arduino stuff, uh, microchip pick, I would imagine. Uh, this is interesting. Thank you for the link. Oh, man, I love our stream. This is why it's coffee talk, right? Because I can't possibly know it all, but all of us can know it all if we if we combine our efforts. Um, real-time engineering operating system, open source. Embedded systems, primary platforms, ARM. So it is ARM. So that means it would run on Raspberry Pi, for those who don't know. 
uh, it's an MIT license, of course. I was afraid of this. See, you know why? Okay, so you, Don, this is this is something that's concerning me. Um, this is we're seeing this in Fuchsia, and we're seeing this at Apple. The the enterprises are done with GPL. They're done with it, and they're like worked at three companies for it, and they use it a lot on our third bit ARM devices. Right? Interesting. That's really interesting news. Thank you for telling us about this. Hmm. Um, I think. Did they port some of the GNU? Though they can't, they can't port it. Did they, uh, John? I'm just really curious. Did they port any of the GNU utilities, like LS and PS and all that jazz? If they, I have a feeling they've developed their own, rather than port the GNU ones. You know, what I'm talking about like the whole GNU suite, whole, the whole GNU suite of of software that 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 you know Stallman insists is the reason that we should call it GNU plus Linux as opposed to just Linux, even though that's ridiculous because lots of other people have contributed to Linux in the, over the years, no, you know, a bunch of others. So um, my, my, the, the point I'm trying to make here is I have a feeling that the people who are using, uh, it's not like Linux at all, right? The people that are using these new operating systems are done with GPL. And the, 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 that's like the sweet spot for a company that wants to embed a device. They are done with GPL3 especially. In fact, I have a feeling that because of GPL3, you know, and they, this is one of the greatest fears against GPL3, you can read about it, uh, is that GPL, GPL3 is going to promote a backlash in the enterprise industry. It doesn't have a CLI. Interesting. Um, that's interesting. It doesn't have a shell at all, huh? But, um, I mean, I, I really want to study that now. That's pretty cool. Don't write your own CLI. Oh, you write your own CLI. You make your make make your own domain specific language, your own REPL, read evaluate print loop, right? Read execute print loop. So that's cool. That's like really really cool. That's really cool. <laughs> I mean, that's because if you can chop everything out and just have a a REPL, you know, a command line that um, that interacts directly with whatever the functions of your device are. Oh my God, that's like huge. And you said three companies are already using it and their ARM devices. Wow. So if you're going to be an embedded programmer, I think that's one thing you need to know. So I have people that are targeting IoT and embedded, and I think that we now have a new thing for them to learn. I like tomorrow because I think embedded systems are going to go that route. They're going to want to write their own really, really ridiculously, you know, low low impact kind of stuff in C and assembly and they're not going to want to have to make it into a Linux thing. So anyway, um, thank you very much for showing us about that. The kernel is only th is only three C files. It makes the code readable, easy to port, and maintainable and it's written almost entirely in C. If there's any question about why C is still a thing, there you go. <laughs> right? C is not going anywhere. C is the closest to the to the hardware besides assembly, if you don't know, and, and it's not going to go anywhere. It's also the smallest. Yeah, so there are, there are hundreds of thousands of companies using it. Really? How have I not? Well, I haven't been studying embedded, to be honest. I am a little surprised that my embedded guys have not come to me with this because they haven't brought that up. I'm actually really pleased that you would talk about this because this is so much better than where Fuchsia is going. I mean, Fuchsia is clearly, you know, all with the Dart UI, and it's clearly going to replace Java on, on a smartphone at some point. I mean, it, it's their hedge bet. I have a feeling. Um, I think it was some passion project that became, on the radar because of the whole lawsuit. That's my point, my 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 perspective on that. But I don't know for sure. Yep, C is not going anywhere. I use it daily. I use C programmers stay pretty quiet. Yeah, you know what? That's true. It's true. And you know what? I'm really glad you said that because. C coders, there's so many C coders out there, but you don't find Reddit forums and Twitter and everything. you know who's really really loud? <laughs> the JavaScript world, the JavaScript world, the amount of noise that they put out into the world, it Rust is pretty loud to <laughs> go to. So these people are a Java. Java paid was it five hundred thousand dollars for a marketing campaign, biggest marketing campaign ever for a language. In fact, some say the only campaign for a language, you know. So, you know, I'm glad you're saying, because I've been saying this, I've been trying to decide, C has always been one of my standard languages that I teach, 
Uh, but I, I don't teach it until, you know, they've, they've got a multi-purpose language under their belt and they've learned web, web languages because of an, I believe that we should empower people uh, and those are the most empowering technologies right now for the common person. But then when it, when it comes time to making devices do stuff for you, seize the language. I mean, you know, yeah, Rust and Go are there too, but even Node, for God's sake, there's people doing like IoT stuff with Node, which I just think is ridiculously stupid, but <laughs> that's fine. So see, yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm really, really glad you mentioned this. Um, did it, oh, Amazon made their own free RTOS too. Hmm, that says a lot. I could spend all day just reading about this. How much time I got? Not enough time. Um, I, I, this is, so this runs on PIC. Have you run it on microchip PIC, Tom? It must. It must. If it takes C stuff, it must run anywhere. Do you know, does it have built-in concurrency? Does it have some concurrency model of some kind? Like maybe an event model or something? Do you know? Allocation with free and very simple. Allocate and free, very simple, fast. Algorithm allocate only. Memory coalescence. There are none of the more advanced features typically found in Linux operating systems. So I have a feeling it doesn't have networking. That's fine. You'd have to add a network stack if you're going to do that. This is on compactness and speed. It can be thought of as a thread library rather than an operating system. Interesting. So that it does deal with concurrency. It sounds like that's what it is. Its primary focus is concurrency. Although command line interface and POSIX like IO abstractions add-ons are available. RTS implements multiple threads by having the human the host program call a thread tick method. Oh my god, this is exactly what I'm looking for for my wife's art. That's red tick methods, which is task dependencies on priority. Holy cow, that's red. That's fantastic. So we're working on a thing where there's like six heads and they all rotate at different intervals. And there's like different modes of rotation. Sometimes they're random, sometimes they're all synchronized, and then they need to be signaled to all look in the center. And we were, we were thinking about putting microcontroller picks on each one of them and then being able to, to signal each one and give it the signal so it would know what to do and it would, t it would you know, it's stepper motor stuff. And um, so we've been, we're probably just going to have a Raspberry Pi and then have a bunch of GPIO pins from the six devices all plugging into the Pi or the ARM, whatever, and then have that, uh, have that, have that report its, its state and tell everything so we can kind of manage it that way. And, but we were going to do Linux on that because, you know, you get, you get, Linux would go and I, I get, you know, concurrency pretty easily and I just can set up messages between all of the different devices and, and abstract their representation as a, um, you know, as a, as a, as a different object or a different uh, data struct. So anyway, that's, I'm, I'm kind of going off in la la land here because I'm like totally stuck on this OS. This is, thank you so much for showing us this. All right, next news. Um, so what is embedded? <laughs> By the way, hey Don, I have a question for you. Is a Raspberry Pi an embedded system? That was on a test recently for certification for somebody. Um, oh, hey, thanks for the follow. Uh, okay. All right, uh, another couple things I... <laughs> you think it is? <laughs> So the question was, name an example of an embedded system. And I got to tell you, a, a Raspberry Pi is not the first thing that comes to mind for me on an embedded system. It's used because it, cause embedded systems to me don't, they, you can't change them up. Raspberry Pi is more of a generic system, but apparently it qualifies as embedded. So everybody make sure you answer that right. Um, I mean, when I think of an embedded system, I think of like a toaster or something like that. Exactly. That is exactly my point. You can use a Raspberry Pi not as an embedded system. You can use a Raspberry Pi as a generic desktop operating system. <laughs> I mean, I have kids that do it every day. So they do not look at their Raspberry Pi and go, oh, that's an embedded system. The embedded system is in my stuffed animal, right? Or it's in my refrigerator. So I don't know. I, was, I, had, I had a little bit of a pedantic problem with that because that, because that was the question that was the answer to the question I was like freaking out on it too much um, so which is my problem with tests in general 
All right, so let's go back. Uh, I do have an email here I wanted to cover. How are we doing on time? Actually, I'm gonna pull my schedule up again. So we are at, so we can, we get we get to go until 11. So we have half an hour, yeah, okay. Uh, Intel makes x86 processors that are considered embedded. Yeah, well, okay, so this is good information because, you know, um, that's what I would have said as long as it just depends on how they're used. And I think that's, I think that's kind of the, the point. Uh, lots of stuff open here. Let me just get to it. All right. So this, I have a, I have a couple of fun things that kind of make me laugh. So I'm going to read them really quick. They're, they're, so I, I've talked about this before. I've talked about how, and, and again, I'm on the stream. I'm moving kind of away from, from web conversations other than how to hack stuff. Um, but, uh, I did want to bring attention to this news news group again. So this is the JavaScript sites and search uh, search group, and um, this is this is a uh, this is a news group entirely about um, fails using JavaScript. <laughs> and so I kind of like it, and I also saddened by it. Um, so. You constantly getting things on here about people. My stuff doesn't work, and I, a couple of them came through. And I just wanted to make the point that if you're using a any kind of single page, um, you know, application framework, uh, React, Vue, even probably Svelte, although I don't know on Svelte, um, you're gonna probably start to have problems. Uh, so yeah, this is basically people who who are reporting that stuff is not showing up. So here's one. I, I thought this was kind of funny. I said, do you happen to hear so it worked? I wish this is a whole thread about somebody's site not working. I thought you guys might laugh at it if you're in IT support. Nothing, so this guy says, it worked properly for two weeks. Nothing has changed. So I just thought it was funny because I don't know how many times I've heard. I think it was so, I, I mean, I think it was so, I, th I think nothing changed, you know? It's just always funny. Do you happen to have a URL? <laughs> This guy spams this huge list and doesn't even send the URL for them to check. So I just, that made me laugh. Um, and so don't be that guy. Well, how, why do you care? <laughs> don't be that guy. If you're going to send a note to a huge mailing list with thousands of people on it, make sure you do your research and you put that research in there because those news groups don't go away. There's no deleting the message later, like Twitter and Reddit. It's it's there forever. <laughs> so, you know, make sure you do your diligence. That's why you care. So if you're going to participate in these things, make sure you do your research first. All right, here we go. So here's another one. Another another error in page resource reported in the URL inspector. Before you dig in, in oh, let's see, here we go. Um, is this the one? Oh, I don't think this is the one. Oh, here it is. Hi, all. I have a React site with this with, with server-side rendering, and most of our images do not display after inspecting the page and are shown as errors on the page source report. We also had the same issue when this site was a CSR. <laughs> Any ideas on how to fix this? That is pretty much the most typical message that I read on this list, and I read on average two or three of them a week. It goes up and down sometimes. But the point is this, React, SSR, which is supposed to take care of all of this problem, and their site's not showing up. So every time somebody talks about how awesome React or Gatsby or any React technology is, or even Vue, and I'm like, are you absolutely sure you didn't just throw your site out of search indexing? And the number of times people don't know the answer to that question is shocking. So if, if you... If you are a web developer or a web applications developer or a full stack developer and you don't know if your site can be searched in the Google search engine and you, you've been, you, you're just following the promise that React is going to properly hydrate your site so that SSR will work proper, so that SSR will fix your SEO, you're going to get burned. That's why you care. The reason you care about this is because if you are a web developer and you do not care about what React can break, and I mean seriously break. And most of the time when stuff is broken, it's because somebody wants, they want search functionality, which means they have a document, not an application. And 
If you want to avoid this problem entirely, make sure that you separate your documents, your document pages, your document web from your application space. And if you have a very clear line between those two, don't you know make a React component just because you want it to animate properly or whatever that can be done with CSS. You know if you if you don't do that separation and you put everything into an SPA with React, and that's why I really don't like SP, even though I really liked it when it came out, is it's like because you've just made your entire documentation site unsearchable. No matter how good you think the hydration is going to work and the SSR is going to work, you have busted your site and you just don't know it. Chances are you don't know it yet. And if if you, there are ways to fix this with React and with Vue and with, you know, SSR, Next.js and all that stuff. But the ways that the technologies that they deploy to do that are so bad. I mean, they literally crawl every one of your web pages locally in order to generate that cache in the first place. They are so error prone and they are so unnecessary now that we have progressive web apps. Progressive web apps allow you to cache a lot of that content on the endpoint, on the, the device, on the phone. So there's no reason for it. You don't even need a lot of that stuff. And in that case, you're seeing like a backlash against some of these these things. You're starting to see more and more people using vanilla uh, JS even for, for for basic stuff. So I'm not against the application web, but I'm really frustrated by reading these people. A lot of times, the people who post these things are uh, managers whose site they've they're browsing their site, and their engineers don't even know their site doesn't work. And I just have to laugh. I mean, it sounds so bad. It's like, well, I'm just a. I would. In fact, there's actually one of these I think in here. No, is this the one? Oh, I can't see. Ba -ba 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 -ba. There's. I can't. I actually read one. I think I deleted it. Hi, hey, Bible. There's. There's. There's one where the guy says, "Hey, I'm just the manager, and I'm just checking out my site." And his engineering team has no idea that his site is not being searched. I feel so bad for the guy. I'm like, oh. I mean, this is why, you know, this is why managers get pointy hair, like like Dilbert or whatever, because they, because because they're like, go so crazy. They're like ripping their hair out because their engineers are like, in some cases, like really, really clueless. And I don't mean that to sound mean. That's that they literally don't have a clue. That means they haven't done the research to get the clue. Uh, and I've been clueless this many, many, many times on things. Like, for example, you know, I just found out about free RTOS, right? So, so it's all about the education. It's all about keeping up. And that's why you care. So be sure to, to do your testing. Be sure to check things out. And particularly if you're using, using web content that's going to be searched, don't reach for React or Gatsby or Vue as your first tool. Like, think about making a site that works first and then putting in the application components that you need um, okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, tool for SSH manage. Oh, this is a great one. It's gonna we're gonna spend a lot of time on that, unfortunately. Um, they are unsearchable, aren't they? Supposed to be static, though. No, they're not, Kip. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Okay, the they are promising you something that does not work. Okay, and Viable's having fun with me. He's trying to trigger me. He knows JSX is probably my biggest trigger word of all. I mean, on a scale of one to ten, JSX is my number ten trigger. You know, most power has the most power. Um, JSX is an abomination. Anybody who doesn't understand why <laughs> should do the research. Um, so yeah, Kip asked the question: What do you mean these sites are unsearchable? Aren't they supposed to be static? So Kip, you are what you are asking is the same question every other engineer and every other manager asks who who doesn't do the research to go and i'm not slamming you they, they don't do the research to understand how the technology they have chosen works in other words they don't look under the hood to be able to validate that it's working do you know what i mean they're not they're not looking under the hood and they're not realizing how well you know have you ever wondered how how is this thing? I mean, it seems pretty magical, right? It's like, oh, you mean you're going to take my entire React application and convert it into a static thing? If you don't know what every one of those words means, like detailed, you're going to get burned. You're going to get really burned. And then you should ask yourself, well, how is it doing that? That's a pretty amazing feat. How How is my this very interactive React app, 
how is that actually being converted into just HTML and CSS? Because that's what static means. How is that happening at all? And if, and if you cannot describe how that's happening and you, your engineers can't tell you exactly what's going on under, underneath there, then you are having a hard time. You're going to have some pain, you know. So, so it's not enough to just pick a tool off the shelf, uh, particularly in the web development world. You've got, you and people do this all the time in the web world, unfortunately, because of what? Because of framework fatigue, right? So they have framework fatigue and they can't keep up anyway. So they grab the latest tool that everyone's, you know, starring and tweeting about and they try to use that and they, 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 they learn it in as few hours as possible. And then they're using the new coolest thing. A lot of times because they're being pressured by by somebody, uh, some higher up to do that. You know, they're being told, hey, you, this is what, this is the thing we should be using. Yeah. Uh, okay. What would you say to a backend made using OOP methodology? Uh, are you viable? Are you just trolling me during the chat today? Is that the only purpose that you have right now? <laughs> I don't have a problem with OOP, backends made with OOP. I, there, I, you just got to make sure you're using the right methodology for your, your task at hand, right? I mean, if you're if you're discording, you're processing lots and lots of, of um, or if you're you know processing a, you're a phone exchange or something like that, it's a different tool. Um, uh, data driven development, yeah. I mean, I'm 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 a big proponent of data driven development, but it, that's that's I would rather look at it that way than look at it as OOP because OOP has never actually materialized. What most people are doing is class programming, which is not object oriented programming. And if if you don't understand that statement. Uh, search for the the different people out there who talk about that. Uh, okay, so class programming in Java is not object oriented programming. I don't care how many people tell you it is; it's not object or object JavaScript programming with prototypes is actually closer to object or true object oriented programming than than uh, class based programming because it needs to be flexible enough to change uh, and compilers and how programs work. Isn't it true that no one really understands how computers and compilers and programs work? It's true. I don't understand how computers and compilers work, but but I I want to. And if you're let's put it this way, if you're picking a framework, if you're picking a frame a large framework for your entire corporate site, I think it would be important for you to understand how the thing works. Um, you know, though, you make a good point because people who pick WordPress or Wix. They're doing it because they don't. They're depending on them. They're trusting them. So, you're absolutely right, zeros. I mean, I think, I think people people are trained to trust the engineers and the developers, and then until that doesn't work for them, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so, wait, how do I differentiate domain driven development with data driven? Oh, well, I mean, domain driven development. I I think that I don't I don't know. They're the same. <laughs> Is that what you're talking about? You're talking about domain driven development. I, I love domain driven development. That's the way I think it should be done. If you're if you're not diagramming your domain from the beginning, then yeah. But the domain is not just the things in the domain. It's what are the things doing. And I just it, my and my data driven is sort of like domain driven, if you ask me. Uh, but I'm not a, an expert on either of those. I every time I've made a big system, it's always been start with what are the names of the things and how do they interact. You know, what are the things and what are the actions? What are the, the items and the events? What are, you know, those kind of things. So, and I don't care what you call it. That's, I think that's just the best way to design anything. Uh, relentless, eager, oh boy. Oh uh, no, do I want to, what is, what is this? You got a clip there? Yeah, my back is in Java. Yeah, domain. My back is in Java. That would be a troll statement. <laughs> yeah, a lot. There's a lot of backends in Java, and again, I, in full disclosure, I was hired at IBM to be a Java programmer. I programmed Java for 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 um, Nike. I gave conference talks on Java, so that's why I don't like it. <laughs> so, just a static site generator riff. Yeah. Oh right. Um, so, if you want to, I just really, I just really think you should go understand what hydration is and truly you know why because I did that I okay so can I give you a quick look? this is a, a short story but it's I want you to understand where I came to this conclusion and we have enough time so and I won't give you all the details but I was such a fan of Gatsby 
I was a huge fan of Gatsby because it used GraphQL, it used a data source, it wasn't blog centric, all of these other amazing things about it. And then I went to start using it and I was like, hmm, that's, how is it, you know, it's, this is going to be searchable. So I, I started asking a question and nobody could really answer it. And then I, then I eventually come across the hydration stuff. So then I gave ViewPress a try for my site. And I have like five or 600 uh, pages or endpoints or whatever you want to call them. And I did ViewPress and, and I was like looking at ViewPress and I'm like, oh, this is really great. And then it got ridiculously slow. And I was like, why is this so slow? And why is it not searched and all this other stuff? It's still, I still have pages that are broken in web archive because I had ViewPress during that time. And this was a documentation site. So I thought, oh, this is awesome. This is, this is view for documentation, which I was really, really a fan of that for a long time. In fact, I told people here how awesome it was for like months. And I was playing around with it. And I was using it. And then all of a sudden it fell on its face. And I was like, why is this thing falling on its face? What's going on? And so I actually dug under the hood and, and I looked at all of the I looked at all of the things it was doing. I looked at the fact that it it created redundant copies of every every web page as hydra you know as the actual static content and then it would send down an exact duplicate of that same data as JavaScript so that it could be loaded into memory. And it was loading all of my site into memory as JavaScript. And that was when I realized, oh my God, <laughs> there is no way there is no way that this is ever going to be sustainable. I mean, if I had grown my site into a much bigger documentation site, that everybody would have had that amount of memory, would have required that amount of memory. And I don't know if they've changed the architecture since then, but boy, when I saw that, I was like, so you're telling, by the way, the thing that was really disturbing is that I found out that the, the static copy, every single static copy of those pages was exactly the same thing I would get if I took a template and just filled in the template with the converted markdown. And when I saw that, I was like, well, that's what I was doing in Pandoc already. And so I was like, Pandoc is better. Pandoc gets that part out. And then I was like, well, well, okay, well, what am I giving up here? Okay, I'm giving up the ability to do dynamic searches of my site. You know, be able to type letters or something and have them pull the site up right away. And that that was not a thing. I couldn't do that anymore. And I was like, well, that sucks. So how am I going to do that? I, fa I figured out that if I just cached the pages using progressive web apps and service workers, I could get the same response time and I could write a little JavaScript thing that just searches a JSON file and finds all the pages. It's actually a thousand times better than Vue and doesn't have to do all the hydration. So we get to hear my stepson like making breakfast. But that's okay. I guess you guys are going to have to just live through that today. <laughs> Tomorrow, hopefully, we'll be up away from the kitchen. So anyway, my, that's my story about ViewPress. It wasn't until my site fell on its face that I looked through the stuff. So it's fair to say that we're trusting the people putting these frameworks out. Uh, but if you, if you're, you know, if you're putting the framework out and then someone comes to you and it's your, in my case, I was my own boss, so it was fine. But if another boss comes to you, you know, if only JavaScript was more like Java, ha, huh. you mean TypeScript, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, I don't even know if I would use JavaScript as a... TypeScript in the browser, is. it makes a lot of sense to me. In fact, you, I've seen massive applications, massive applications that are thousands and thousands of lines long that are done in TypeScript that are all in the browser, including 3D graphics development platforms, like uh, back in the game development time when we were doing that. Um, there's So JavaScript has definitely come into its own as a major language, even though Unity dropped it completely, pretty much. <laughs> so anyway... How much time we got? 15 minutes. Let's see if I can go through a few more things here. Uh, some fun stuff. Uh, I think I'm going to cover this email next time because I haven't got a chance to read it all and it always has. By the way, the opensource.com mailing list is really, really good. Uh, ooh, that's got a Lua Chi Chi. Awesome. It's got a lot of little hints in it if you want to subscribe. Uh, again, I have there in Raleigh, which is down the, not down the street, but other side of the state here. Um, so that's really good. Something interesting too. I found out um, this. This is. A, I'll, I'll talk about this in OSCP. Um, but I, well, I'll wait and talk about it. But to say, I discovered that the mailing address for the Kali Linux and for offensive security is literally two miles away from here. <laughs> it's it's on Cor it's on Cornelius Catawba Boulevard. It's near the UPS store where I go do all my stuff. I kid you not. I read it from the Kali Linux book. 
Um, and uh, I, I read it from the Cali Linux book, and I was like, this address is literally like 10 minutes away. Yeah, I'm going to. I'm going to. In fact, when I read it this morning, I was like, I'm just going to go down there right now. So as soon as I'm done here, during some of my OSCP, uh, the time on the schedule coming up, uh, where is that, by the way? So I'm going to I'm gonna take a break, like at the 3 o'clock break or so, and I'm going to drive down there. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm, I want to knock on their door because I want to see what they're doing. I mean, that, I think it's just a remote. I have a feeling it might even be just a post office box, but it's not. It's an actual address. So I'm really curious to see what that what that's about. Um, so anyway, and by the way, if it's a plug for this, if you want to study together for the OSCP and everything that might you might want need in addition to that, so ground zero to OSCP basically, um, every day from for three hours from noon to three, is, is I'm allocating for that. If I ever have to close for any reason, you'll get it. You'll see a close sign on my site. I'm, I've made the close sign now, so you can actually I'll post the close sign. That means today's today's. Uh, Today's stuff is not happening for whatever reason because there's there's going to be times that I'm going to need to close and and I'm I'll just put the close sign up and you'll see that I'm not not open for that day. Um, so and usually when I close it it means it'll say when I'm going to come back. Um, I actually want to make a plugin that does that, but I whatever. For now it's just the stuff close for Windows updates exactly. <laughs> Going out on the door say we're a bunch of hackers. I want the OSCP <laughs> demand answers. <laughs> Exactly. So um, I, let's see if I missed anything big in the news. So other than I, I've I got I don't there's really nothing to report here. I'm going to talk about this today at twelve. But I I've uncovered at least a couple dozen, if not three dozen, uh, documents about the OSCP. One of the most scary ones, and so I'm going to talk about that at twelve. I don't want to spend too much time on, on it right now, but I do want to mention it. So this guy. This guy who was posting information about OSCP had a DCMA added to him and he, they took down, they forced him to take down all his material. So let me just tell you, look at all of these sites that were affected. See all this? So uh, if you're going to study for an OSCP and you want to post your data, you know, I think we don't need to be afraid of it, but we need to be cautious. And I actually tweeted about this. Now, the amount of stuff that's actually part of their agreement that you're not going to give up information about the tests, obviously. But there's, you know, they can talk about this thing is definitely on the test and this thing is not on the test without doing specific. But it's a fine line. And this this just goes to show that offensive security is, is actively uh, making sure that information about their test and their, their content is not shared. So, and that includes basic notes. So CTF notes that in, that involve capture the flag have been even though the whole material wasn't included they talk about that uh, they were they were told to take the content down if you are caught doing this and I read this the other day you get a lifetime ban for all certificates so they don't mess around with this stuff um, I don't know what to make of that I mean that I, I understand why they have to do it because people would just hack the certificate and just get it just so they can get a job people that all the time they 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 unfortunately they have to have an antagonistic relationship with the people that are going for the certificate because it's you versus the machine yeah but still the fact that they're in in the camp that's likely to send DMCAs out that's that means that they're a business and that they are you know they are concerned about that kind of stuff so you know i would I'm I'm actually kind of concerned about putting any YouTube content at all. Uh, a DCMA takedown that hits you on YouTube is automatically a strike, and you're put on the defensive immediately. So even if your content, even if you just use the word, you know, OMCP study group, and you they say you didn't get authorization to use that trademark or something like that, if they're that kind of person and they send it, YouTube doesn't care. They'll just they'll automatically give you a strike. And you you can appeal it, I guess. I don't. I'm not a good you, no, YouTuber. I don't know a lot, but but this means that that we really really don't want to make videos about OSCP stuff. So um, the reason I'm telling you that is because I'm going heavily into the OSCP on the stream, and and in every case it's going to be us studying, and and we're just going to be studying generically about the stuff that 
that you know we're going to talk about the test and how to take it and all the preparation but we got to be really careful and i i'm not going to be saving content about the oscp preparation so that's the main takeaway why do you care why do you care because if you don't turn in but tune in between this particular time you'll never see that content i am i am not i i i am never ever going to record oscp content other than to document what i feel are not OSP, OSCP specific things that everybody should learn. So everybody should learn Nmap. That that has nothing to do with OSCP. So I will be doc, I will be making you know stuff what I feel that'll go into Ground Zero about you need to understand these things before you even go into OSCP, and that is not a violation of any kind of copyright or any any trademark or something. Are you acting as an unpaid advocate for a corporation? Do we know the eth- eth- efficacy in the real world? Pretty hard. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, are you just being transparent and say, hey, I make YouTube and Twitch content. What can I show and what can I not cover it all? And I actually want to do that. In fact, I really I kind of hope that they actually are down the street because if, if they are down the street, I can go, hey, this is this. I am so jazzed. I'm like your biggest fanboy. I want to be an OSCP guy. And the reason I bring it up right now is because it's because during my, um, you know, kind of research this morning, um, this morning, I uncovered a ton of stuff that is not legal. <laughs> I mean, it is definitely not legal. And so I'm kind of conflicted because, you know, and if you're watching Offensive Security, I'm trying to do the right thing here. I, I sincerely want to do the right thing, but I know that I've seen content that does not belong on the Internet at all. And, and I was just searching. I was just doing random searches and stuff was pulling up. And so I was like, well, which of this stuff can I actually look at? And which of this stuff, if I read it, is a violation of the policy when I go to take the test? I'm going to be, I'm probably at some point going to be signing in blood saying offended security. Yeah. <laughs> at some point I'm going to be signing off on saying, hey, you, you, you agreed to, to not cheat. Well, what if, what if one of the study guides I downloaded turns out to be and I don't know this, but what if what if one of the ones that turned out actually is the content from, you know, a lab that was copyrighted that I shouldn't have been able to get a hold of without signing up for the lab? And a lot of times I don't know because a lot of this content has been digested by other people. And so then you end up, yeah, how about LS dash capital R? <laughs> I don't know. Um, by the way, today I, I did I needed some flu some fine flu fine foo that I didn't have, but I ended up discovering the dash R string for LS. Oh, right, sounds recursive. Um, yeah, you can do that too. There there is definitely LS recursive stuff, but find find is universal and on every system and it's POSIX. So there you go. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, so so that's I guess that's enough. There's nothing. I don't think there's anything big that I miss in the in the Twitter. Uh, so, oh, Apple Apple uh, intentionally broke their iPhones. This is this was in the news. This is big news. App, Apple admitted and is now paying a huge class action lawsuit. Uh, <laughs> I just got positive positive. St- um, Apple admitted and it, that it intentionally broke old phone old iPhones, forcing them to slow down to quote preserve battery life. <laughs> so so they they are um they are paying out what is it like twenty five dollars to like thousands of customers so my POSIX cars <laughs> dude I yeah no <laughs> uh this makes me a little scared so this is the takedown notice that I sent um that, that I just mentioned so we talked about that. Actually, I actually added off second here because I kind of want an answer. I'm not trying to, you know, I'm trying to do the right thing here. So, uh, it's official. It took me way too long to enter Hack the Box, but I did that last night. So, that's, I don't know if that's news, but I made, I finally got my account on Hack the Box, which is ridiculously hard for a beginner. I'm not a beginner, but I was trying to let beginners do it. And I can tell you right now that they're, to get even an account on there is going to require a lot of skill without cheating. And so don't get frustrated if you find yourself unable to do hack the box on your first attempt because it is not over the wire, <laughs> which is fun it's for young people and beginners. All right, so um, 
do, 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 there was, I, I want to just bring attention to this, uh, a, a, another person on Twitter, John Opdenacker, um, asked the question about all the people from, sec, the, from InfoSec and from SecOps and all that that he follows, and this is a really, really great thread of a bunch of people if you wanted to build your own list of uh, InfoSec people. Uh, I plan on making a list out of all of that, but I don't have one yet. My primary list will be pen testing, and so yeah, uh, and yeah. So lots of lots of fun stuff out there. There's another link to start hacking. Uh, this is something somebody on the stream showed me yesterday. Uh, it's uh, a place uh, to just practice. Where do you start in hacker skills? Uh, I haven't looked at it very carefully. I I. It is a younger person that's having fun with it. Uh, I, I don't think that this is specifically designed for OSCP, even though it might be more uh, suited for people who are who are younger. And uh, so, yeah, I learned better on the job anyway. Who 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 would cheat on the sign up test for a CTF? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I know. Who 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 would cheat on that? I don't know, man. People might. That's like I. This is gonna sound horrible, but I've had I've had a a couple really intelligent people at Skillstack, who I had to call out because they were claiming they made stuff in their GitHub that I know they copy and paste it from somebody else, and they're smart. They had no reason to do it. So popcorn, yeah. It's like I was like, why are you doing that? Like it's not okay for you to do that. It's okay for you to study other people. It's not okay for you to copy and paste their stuff and claim it's yours. You know, redo the thing or say how cool you is this thing you just found over here. It's like so, and these are otherwise these are very good people. They were young, and I was like, so I I don't doubt for a second. I've had at least four people here who would lie about their CTF thing, and they would, you know, they would do it. They would definitely do it. So, yeah. So copied without the forked from attribute string. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what they did is they just they just copy and pasted. They looked at the other code, and I said, and, and they they were so proud of you know what this is what makes me sad is it's like if I'm doing anything that makes the people that are here feel like they have to to sort of let's say exaggerate to to get my approval then I'm being a bad person because <laughs> I was like because one of them one of them came up to me and he goes. He goes, I want you to show you what I did. And he was really excited. I was like, okay. I'm looking at it. I'm thinking to myself, he didn't do this. But that's a very tough position to be in. You know, it's like, well, you know, fork from is is fine. And I do that too. You know, we all do that. As long, By the way, that's not illegal. It's not illegal to remove your fork from and copy your stuff and keep the thing in. But this, this was like a straight up rip. I mean, it was like the whole entire thing. And, you know, he's talking about, um, I mean, it was a long time ago, but I can't remember the exact words but he was saying something like yeah this is really cool and I said oh that's cool it's like and then I asked him to describe some of the code and I'm like well tell me about this code right here what is that how did you figure that out because we hadn't taught, covered it or taught and he goes well you know and he kind of stumbled on it and he didn't know it and I it, I had to very delicately say okay that's really cool because I don't want to say hey I don't believe you you ripped this off it's too good <laughs> okay, so, I mean, that's that's not an encouraging that's not an encouraging thing to say right I mean what do you do with that what do you do with that when you think that somebody's done something like that? It's like I don't know what to say. So I was like, I was like, as as delicately as I could, I just told him. I said, look, I said, so I I think I don't remember. I don't remember asking. I I just I honestly don't remember. I don't remember if I asked him or not if he had got it from someplace else. There was another person that I definitely found out about that, and they they um. They told me all. They told me that they had got it from some other place, you know. And I was like, "Well, that's fine. There's no problem doing that. Just, you know, just kind of own that." Uh, to put them on a blast on Twitter. No way. <laughs> this can't be your code. Ha ha ha. Yes, this code looks like some super golfed function. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, that was why it was really obvious because his other code wasn't even really styled well, and then that code had a sort of a different style and some other thing. So, yeah, anyway, enough of that. Uh, it's good to have you. It's 11 o'clock. It's time for me to go. Um, and uh, I think uh, that's some, some things to... Uh
to look up. This has been kind of a mishmash of things, as Coffee Talk generally is. We're kind of all over the place. Um, but I am uh, looking forward to getting on with the OSCP stuff in an hour. I don't know if I have time to go check out the the address right now. So, uh, time for go. Yeah, we are going to be coding... Well, let's see. Where's my schedule? Big difference around here. Or time to go. Time to go, time for go. Uh, I'm going to take a take a break here and then uh, a short break to put this video up and then uh, we'll be back. It's going to be completely random offensive security stuff uh, and I actually will show you guys some of the material that I downloaded legally. Nothing I did was from the dark web or anything or deep web and by the way, even if I did that, it wouldn't be bad. It wouldn't be illegal. But um, I'd really appreciate the community's input on some of the resources that I found and whether they are legit. Because I, I'm actually I started building a bookmarks list, uh, kind of a, a knowledge base of legitimate resources you can go to to study for the test. Um, that are you know because I would like to prepare something that's specifically for OSCP as, as much as possible. Like you can't really use that name uh, without calling it that. And um, yeah, I'm building custom Lally to in ISO today. So let me know how it goes. Awesome. Um, yeah, and there's a bunch of things. The Kali Linux ISO is is a thing. Um, so I've been trying to trying to get my head around that that part. I mean, I've done it three times, but I don't know how to process that and if I can use the document that I found about that. So anyway, when you get OSCP, do you put it after your name or your business card? I don't know. I would. I mean, I would put OSCP everywhere <laughs> once you have it because, yeah, it's like you know, OSCP is the, is I think it's the single biggest uh, thing here. Uh, what are what are building the calendar? The calendar. Uh, this the weekly schedule thing I've been doing is is just uh, LibreOffice or you know it's just uh, Libre Calc or whatever it is their spreadsheet tool. And then I I've just been converting them into PDFs and and cup, chopping and pasting. Them. I mean Viable was one of the first people to suggest they use Google something or this or that. And I I'm not I don't have a problem with that, but uh, I wanted something more visual. So that's why I did it. I, I it's just a it's just a spreadsheet with a bunch of tables. That's a bunch. That's all it is. It's a bunch of colored tables. Uh, let's see other questions. Uh, the whole card would just be the words OSCP. <laughs> you know what? It would probably be that. For me, I would probably put OSCP, and if I got my OSCE, I'd put it on there. Yeah, bond size seventy. <laughs> that would be me. Yeah. No, it's yeah. Viable is a troll. He's trolling you. It's not JSX. It's not not JSX. You couldn't even do that with JSX. So, uh, all right, all right, gang. Um, I I'm gonna turn the stream off just so I know how to to get to where I need to go. But uh, yeah, if you want to check in for more more stuff, I'm actually looking forward to the OSCP. So I I end up doing it instead of yoga this morning. I'm kind of waiting till. Until I move to do the other stuff. So, uh, no other questions. I'm going to just take off and.